Do you know how was the dramatic end of the famous Italian Foreign Minister Gael Azzocano, who was also the son-in-law of Mussolini himself? Have you heard about the constant fight that Chano had with his mother-in-law in relation to the alliance that Italy had with Germany? Do you know what was the definitive act of betrayal that led Mussolini to have this member of his own family shot? Welcome everyone to the War Stories channel, today we are going to analyze the rise and fall of this peculiar Italian character, who was undoubtedly very important in Italy's role in World War II. And it is that although we always focus on the most famous and well-known characters, which are basically the visible faces, this time we are going to analyze one of those people who were pulling the strings from the shadows. Ciano was born in the region of Tuscany, in the town of Livorno in 1903. He was the son of a high-ranking Italian naval officer named Constantius, who would later fight in the First World War, becoming a hero during it, until such a point that the King of Italy gave him the title of Count. Constantius' ardent nationalism led him to become involved with Mussolini, even becoming president of the Chamber of Deputies from 1934 until his death in 1939. Due to the importance and wealth of his father, Ciano always enjoyed a very luxurious life in which he was surrounded by powerful people from Italy. Without being very clear about what his professional career was going to be, Ciano studied law in the city of Rome, although later he tried to become a journalist. While deciding on one thing or another, Ciano fell in love with Benito Mussolini's daughter named Etta and married her in 1930 at the age of 27. Thus, with such an important father in this new Italy that he was being born, and also having Mussolini's own daughter as his wife, everything was prepared for Ciano's future to be promising. However, the relationship between Ciano and Etta was not very good and the numerous infidelities that both carried out were known by Italian public opinion. In any case, after getting married, Ciano traveled to Shanghai to work as an Italian diplomat at the embassy. Ciano's adventure in Asia lasted about three years, until in 1933 he returned to Italy. It was from then on that he began to get involved in the government of his Mussolini and worked in different communication and press positions. Finally in 1935 he was appointed Minister of Press and Propaganda. Ciano's political career was briefly interrupted by his volunteer participation in the conquest of Ethiopia, in which Mussolini's son-in-law fought as a bomber pilot. When in 1936 he returned to Italy, he was appointed Minister of Foreign Affairs, this being the position that he would occupy for the longest time and in which he would carry out the most important actions of his life. During these early years his reputation was so good that many saw him as Mussolini's natural successor, should the Italian leader die suddenly. Let us make a small point here to comment that in those years the relationship between Italy and Germany was not as good as it is believed today, and in the mid-1930s it was not at all clear that both countries would be allies in a future conflict. What Mussolini wanted above all else was for Italy to become a great European power, on a PAR with France and Great Britain. For this he needs to modernize his country and of course, control a great colonial empire like the French and English did. To achieve this, it was vitally important for Mussolini to transform Italian society in order to create a new man in Italy. A hard-working and warrior man, and not a cowardly lazy bum who rejects war and sacrifice. Based on this there is a phrase that Mussolini would later say, which came to say that the Italians want an empire, but are not willing to make the necessary sacrifice to achieve it. In any case, if France and Britain supported them in their goal, or at least did not stand in their way, Mussolini was in favor of helping them keep Germany asleep and in check. This is demonstrated by the signing of the Stresa Pact in 1935, in which Mussolini agrees with France and Great Britain to curb Germany's expansionary intentions in Europe. However, shortly after Mussolini's desire to conquer Ethiopia, his agreements with the French and English were broken, and a series of trade sanctions were imposed on Italy. Finally, Italy ceased to be part of the League of Nations in 1936, and based on its benefit, it had no choice but to change its ally and approach Germany. During all these years, Ciano tried to keep Italy as far away from Germany as possible, since in his opinion, this alliance would lead to a large-scale war for which Italy was not prepared. After many discussions with his mother-in-law, on May 22, 1939, Ciano was practically forced to sign the Pact of Steel, 
which basically tied the destiny of Italy and Germany to the same heaven or hell. In an attempt to keep Italy away from Germany's military actions, Chano coined the term non-belligerence so as not to join the war against Poland and the rest of the Allies in September 1939. This somehow violated the treaty that a few months ago both countries had signed, but the truth is that the Germans did not care and continued with their objective. Arriving at this situation, Mussolini felt totally frustrated, because on the one hand he had not been able to achieve his desire for expansion with France and Great Britain as allies, and now he saw that he was not going to achieve it with the Germans either. Although at first he thought that the relationship that he was going to maintain with Hitler was one of equals, Mussolini understood that he was going to be in second place again, and that he would only opt for the crumbs that the Germans left him. Due mainly to this, the alliance between the two was based on mistrust, and each began to act alone without communicating anything to the other. Despite this, subsequent military operations went well, achieving success after success until the summer of 1941. Returning to Chano's role during these early years, we have to say that it was always to prevent Italy from participating in any European conflict alongside the Germans, whether in Poland or later in France. To do this, he spoke with Italian generals and recommended that they insist that Italy was not prepared for war, and that they ask the Germans for a long list of supplies. In view of this, Hitler even told Mussolini that he had traitors in his own family. In any case, and due to the overwhelming success of the German army, Mussolini definitively joined Germany in its war against France and Great Britain on June 10, 1940, when the German campaign over France was practically over. Of course this was done to Chano's disapproval. When in June 1941 Germany attacked the Soviet Union, Mussolini sent some 60,000 Italians who were on Russian soil by August of that year. Later, in an attempt to get Germany to finish the campaign successfully, the Italian army in Russia reached 220,000 men in 1942. While Chano's negative comments about Italy's alliance with Germany had hitherto been overlooked because everything was going well, from the end of 1942 they began to be a problem. As is evident, from what happened in November 1942 in Stalingrad and in North Africa, it was clear that Italy was in great danger. This was the perfect opportunity to get Italy to disassociate itself from Germany and Chano took advantage of it, trying to get many generals to join his cause now that everything seemed lost. Without a doubt, Mussolini also wanted peace to be reached on the Eastern Front, and also with the United States, since he never entered into his plans to antagonize them. However, he knew that she was a puppet in the hands of Hitler, and that he could not send a simple message to the German leader to tell him that their relationship was over. Thus, he had no choice but to dismiss his son-in-law in February 1943 and remove him from the government as much as possible. His new position was that of Italian ambassador to the Holy See, which was practically unimportant. The situation continued to evolve until Italy itself was invaded in July 1943, when the Allies landed in Sicily. This led to a meeting of the Great Fascist Council, which ended up presenting a motion of censure against the depressed Mussolini. The result of the vote was that Mussolini would be dismissed, and of course Ciano voted in favor of that being the case. Mussolini was then rounded up and arrested, finally being rescued by the Germans in September of the same year. From then on, everything went from bad to worse for Chano, and everything he had planned for him turned out in the worst possible way. In the first place, he was unable to apply for a position in the new government that was being formed due to his strong links with Mussolini himself, and because of the important position he had held in him. Well, if there was something this new government wanted, it was to disassociate itself from its recent past. Germany suspected that the Italian king's intentions would be to change sides, which became clear in early September. This caused Germany to quickly invade Italy to firstly depose said government, and secondly, to be able to stop the Allied advance. This left Ciano in no man's land since he was neither wanted by the new Italian government, nor by the Germans, nor by the Italian Republic that Mussolini was preparing to lead in the north of the country. Thus, and in the face of all this convulsive situation, Ciano tried to escape from Italy and went to Munich with the intention of flying to Spain. Before being able to flee definitively to Spain, 
He was arrested by the Germans and in October 1943 he was sent back to Italy to be tried as a traitor. Mussolini was furious with him, as he had been a key player in his overthrow a few months earlier, so he sent him to prison. It was evident that Chano was going to be shot, so his wife asked his father to forgive him. However, Mussolini could not forgive him in any way and told his daughter that he would eventually be executed. Chano took advantage of this time to put his diary in order, in which he had written all his actions and thoughts of the last years. During the Verona trials, in which Chano was being tried, his wife tried to organize an escape, and even threatened his father with sending information to Hitler that could harm him. But none of this changed Chano's fate and he was finally sentenced to death on January 11, 1944. This execution was carried out in a rather curious way, because the people who were going to be shot were seated on a chair and had their backs to the firing squad. According to some witnesses, the shooters did not have much experience and some shots were missed, not reaching their victims in vital areas and having to fire more than one shot. They also comment that Chano was the only one who managed to turn around and die facing his executioners. The truth is that Chano was a very interesting figure within Italy, and his diaries provide an incredible amount of information, giving us first-hand details of many important meetings that took place at that time. He was a man who obtained a very high position of power in Mussolini's government, which he achieved in part through his marriage to his daughter, but even so he ended up turning against him and became one of his greatest enemies within of the Italian government. I did not want to saturate this video with personal comments from Chano that you can read in his diary, since I wanted to tell this story in a linear way, but if you like the memoirs of the protagonists of this conflict as I do, I recommend that you read them. And well, this is the end of this program about this interesting character, which I sincerely hope you liked. I leave you in the description the program we did with Antonio Munoz about the Italo-German campaign in North Africa. Thank you all for being a part of this community, and especially the sponsors who make this possible. Subscribe and share this program if you liked it, and see you in the next one. See you soon.